ocean in the Philippines is full of the most amazing and biologically fascinating critters. Today, instead of telling you what I know about these critters, I'm going to let you know what questions I still have about life in the ocean. This is Mark 2, the questions. This is a sea slug, a nidobrank, Mexicomis multituberculata. To its left is an amphipod, a skeleton shrimp. The skeleton shrimp is tiny, but it's feisty. And it pokes the nidobrank, and it, the nidobrank gets the message and turns to the right. This is the kind of thing you see when you dive all the time, and particularly when you dive all the time with a camera. This is such a fun and in a way spectacular piece of natural history that I'd like to look at it again in slow motion and zoomed in. So here's the first poke and here's the second poke right at the edge of the mantle and the new prank decided it doesn't want to fight this fight. The little crustacean can go on against this new prank but there are surprisingly few predators of new pranks. I don't think I've ever seen a fish eat one. I believe this is because of the many poisons which these mollusks contain in their bodies. But why didn't a predator evolve which can deal with the poison? Or are these poisons so different? There's work on this question, of course, but I'm still waiting for a unified theory of nudibrank poisons and nudibrank ecology. This in the back is my friend says. In the front, you just see an eye sticking out from the sand. You don't want to touch the animal attached to this eye. This is a reef stone fish, one of the most viciously venomous fishes known to science. It looks nasty. If you get injected the venom from its dorsal fin spines, you might die lose a hand or be in serious pain for a whole week. Here, this is just the eye of this stonefish looking out of the sand. This stonefish has evolved a venom which to me is much, much more powerful than would be necessary to just defend itself against a couple of predators looking for meal under the sand. Why it is overkill? Why is this animal so incredibly dangerous? And this thing here, is this a worm or is this a part of the stonefish? Now, what are we looking at now? This is an unborn scorpion fish. And in fact, also the unborn scorpion fish is quite venomous. But what really makes this animal stand out is its expert's expert camouflage. Without knowing that this is a fish, you would swim past this and think that you've just seen a boring ball of filamentous algae rocking back and forth in the surge. This animal is a master of camouflage. On top of that, they have a certain plasticity. They can adjust the color and the type of hair to the environment. Now, this is a similar master of camouflage. This is a hairy frogfish, and this hairy frogfish is particularly known to change its color in response to the environment it lives in. Now, my question here is, what is the circuit in the animal here? How do the eyes connect to the growth of the skin? to get the camouflage just right. What is the neural to hormonal to you know, skin growth system which has been perfected to get the camouflage to these amazing levels in these fishes? This is a sea slug, which is not a nudibranch, by the way, commonly called Sean the Sheep. This is a sarcoglossum and it has figured out a unique trick in evolution. So what this sea slug does, it feeds on this algae. You can actually see it's sitting on this algae. The animal is really only a couple of millimeters in length. And a lot of this algae in Darwin, where a lot of this footage is from, have one or two or maybe even three shown the sheeps. Now, what Sean does is 
instead of completely digesting the cells of the algae, it feeds on. It takes the organelles, the photosynthetic organelles, the little parts of the algae cells, which take sunlight and turn it into biological energy. So then the new, the, not the new rank, the sarcoglossin stores these chloroplasts in its body and they keep making biological energy from sunlight while they're already in the body of the sea slug. So my question here is, this is such a fantastic strategy. Why have not more animals taken advantage of this trick? So of course giant clams do this and corals, these are all sessile organisms, but why don't humans do this? So what these Sarcoclos and sea slugs are doing essentially comes down to this. It's equivalent to me eating this fine salad here and then my body taking the chloroplasts from the cells of this salad, inserting them into my body and then me continuing to do photosynthesis using the salad's chloroplasts. Just like there is kleptoplasty, in this nudibranch here, there is actually nidoplasty, which is a very similar strategy of stealing cells from another animal and continuing to use them once they are inserted into the body of the sea slug. Just in this case, what the sea slug is doing, it's taking the stinging cells from the anemones it feeds on. Now, these sea slugs live in warm, very rich ecosystems. And there's there got to be lots of parasites and viruses and bacteria which are potentially affecting these animals. So, without knowing too much about the molluscan immune system, and I would actually be very interested in learning more about that if anybody has some good pointers i'm assuming that these animals must have functioning immune systems how does that work that you then insert the cells from another animal in your body and there is not a massive rejection akin to a organ transplantation without all these massive, massive drugs which the receivers of organ transplants in humans have to get. So what is going on here in terms of molluscan immunology of the immune system of mollusks having this very specific blind spot which allows the slug to insert these functioning stinging cells into its body. On the other hand, why don't the stinging cells go off? So there is a trick going in two directions. Why isn't there a massive rejection? And why don't the stinging cells get triggered once they're in the sea slug? <laughs> Seagrass, and this is a shallow part of the ocean, and there are waves and the currents, and this, there's the surge acting on the bottom of the ocean, which is only about two or three meters deep where I think it is. And so this fire urchin gets kicked away by the surge here. So the smaller you are, the more dangerous and the more powerful the surge in these shallow areas underwater is. Now, it's well known that small fish don't do well in very surge areas. Let's look at this sea slug. Here's a sea here. It's about the size of a person's hand, so it's a rather big animal. How can these small animals cope with currents and surges and waves, which are massive, massive natural forces in relation to their body sizes. And is there an upper limit? Is there an amount of physical energy in the ocean 
below which there cannot be a, a muck fauna, below which all of these small critters and sea slugs and small fishes cannot survive and they have to find another place to thrive. So there's another nidibrank. I filmed the footage for this mini documentary over the course of several weeks in the Philippines. I did not particularly seek out nidibranks, but there are just so many species everywhere. So what caused this explosion of biodiversity, this adaptive radiation, particularly in the tropical Indo-Pacific? I know there's some good scientific work on that. I still think it's a fascinating question. I believe to a good degree it's the specialization on the types of food these animals eat. Yeah, by the way, this is one of my favorite wet lenses. This is the Inon Bagai lens. And of course, I'm speeding things up a little bit here with a time lapse to make that new prank sprint instead of crawl. So fascinating animals. So this is a goby. And the gobies are small fishes. Actually, some of the smallest fishes in the world are gobies, so we'll get back to that later. Now, these are just as biodiverse as the pranks. Uh, many hundred species of gobies living in the tropical Indo-Pacific. They are often very well camouflaged, they're hiding in burrows. There's this really interesting symbiosis with shrimp, which they share these burrows with and the gobies have been both the subject of some of my academic research as well as the subject of a book which I wrote and there is this question so the smallest gobies are about six or seven millimeters long short really why are they so short and to be more precise why are there no short gobies they're actually invertebrate animals which are much, much smaller than six millimeters. So these six millimeters, they seem to be the minimum limit for vertebrate animals. So there is no frog, there is no fish, goby or other fish, which is smaller than that. So what causes this lower limit for vertebrate size? So this is a question which I'm also academically working on right now. Fascinating. Obviously, we're looking at a time lapse here. This is one of the shrimp associated gobies. And, you know, it's really not moving much over the course of several minutes. The gobies like to save energy. So, this one is just manning or womaning its burrow. Okay, next question. Back to the invertebrates. So, here this is a rope. So human-made habitats often play a big role in the ocean these days. And this is a fire urchin. This is a close-up of the fire urchin. You can see the tube feet and you can see the spines. And this is actually a really dangerous urchin. So if you just slightly touch that, you're going to be in pain. And there are two gastropod mollusks on there. And uh, they're stuck together in a sense that, in a position that I think they're mating. And they are only one of many species which live on the surface of echinoderms, particularly sea urchins. So the question here is, what have they figured out? What communication system have these hitchhikers, these commensals, or maybe they are parasites, or maybe they live in a mutualistic symbiosis? Often I think that's still not known. What do these animals communicate with the sea urchin and how do they do it so that they can persist on the surface of these animals which give them a lot of protection? So I think that's a good question. Are we looking at a strange planet here? No, it's my shadow in the sand filmed with a bug eye lens. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, please consider subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment here, or maybe sending me a super like. Also, I wrote three books, one with James Reimer about environmental problems in the ocean, and then there's The Life of Gobies, and a book about scuba diving neuroscience, Your Brain on Diving. So check these out, and see you soon.